All right, still in domain one, security and risk management. Now we're gonna talk about managing personnel security in this section here. What is personnel security? Obviously, individuals within the organization, internal personnel are the ones that have access to critical data. They're the ones that understand how things operate within the business. Uh, they're also the people or the individuals that we're trying to protect. Uh, but when we talk about personnel security, we're not talking about protecting life safety or protecting individuals within the organization. We're talking about protecting organizations from individuals. Internal threats uh, consist of at least 70% of the different types of cyber threats and cyber attacks that exist in businesses today. So implementing controls or putting controls in place to protect uh, internal assets and information from attacks uh, from the inside is pretty critical. So we wanna implement things like segregation or separation of duties meaning that not one individual has complete control over uh, a particular function or role. Uh, we need to make sure that we have specifically defined job descriptions. Uh, why would I want to employ mandatory vacations? Um, there is a, uh, a show that I watch called American Greed, and it talks about, uh, you know, different types of crime and uh, typically financial crime and whatnot. Uh, and one of the, um, the, uh, the uh, uh, topics or one of the, the episodes uh, talked about a comptroller in a small town uh, that was embezzling or skimming money from, uh, from the town because they were the ones that were responsible for all the accounts payables and accounts receivables. And the only time that she got caught, and it was tens of millions of dollars eventually, but the only reason she got caught is because she had, uh, she was sick, uh, a long-term illness that left her out of work for a significant amount of time. So somebody else had to take her position, uh, and in that, in doing so, they were able to uncover, uh, you know, suspicious activity, and and eventually led to an investigation and and identified the fraud. Uh, mandatory vacations can help do that as well. When you send an employee on vacation, ultimately somebody has to take over the roles or the responsibilities of that employee. And, uh, and hopefully in that process, they can identify anomalies in transactional events that are occurring and so on. Job rotation can do a similar thing. Uh, not only does job, job rotation provide the ability to identify anomalies, but it also provides the ability to cross-train employees so that you have redundancy in, in uh, employees that can perform certain job functions and so on. And probably one of the most common principles that we implement is the least privilege principle or the need to know, meaning that you're only going to be given access based on your role within the organization or rules that we've defined, uh, RBAC, is what we call that rule-based or role-based ac uh, access control, depending on which one you're referring to. Um, but in other words, you're gonna get access to systems and resources uh, that are necessary for you to perform your function, but that's about it. Uh, the new hire that we bring on board, uh, we need to define specifically the duties of that hire. We need to make sure that we do our due diligence in that hiring process. Uh, do the reference checks, do the background checks, uh, make sure that the new employee signs the appropriate confidentiality agreements or non-disclosure agreements, especially if they're dealing with intellectual property, uh, trade secrets, etc. Uh, we have to have a very specific offboarding process as well. When an employee gets terminated, we need to be able to identify the procedures and the policies that are in place or the steps that we put in place to ensure that we reduce access for that individual, we remove accounts, we lock out accounts, we remove physical building access, etc. We also protect against the exfiltration, the unwanted exfiltration of information for an employee leaving, uh, making sure that they're turning in all their corporate resources uh, or corporate sponsored resources like laptops and mobile devices and so on. Uh, part of establishing 
uh, personnel security means also establishing job classification. Uh, you know, if it, 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 and you guys uh, often, uh, or several of you do work in the defense sector, so you understand the need for job classification, uh, which then extends also to uh, um, personnel um, certification and, and classification. So do you have a clearance? What type of clearance level do you have? What does that clearance level give you access to? What information does that clearance level give you access to? The idea being that uh, we want to restrict again what an individual has access to to reduce the potential amount of harm that individual can cause, either intentionally or unintentionally, um, you know, uh, based on releasing information or stealing information and so on. Uh, that Booz Allen employee comes to mind uh, that's still living in Russia right now. Uh, you know, when, when he uh, took information from uh, Booz Allen regarding military, uh, you know, based on the relationship with Booz Allen and the military contracts. Um, the role-based access, uh, RBAC, uh, R-B-A-C. Uh, we, we actually have a couple of different RBAC definitions. We have role-based and we have rule-based. Uh, oftentimes, those ter terms can be interchangeable uh, because the rules are based on the role. Uh, but role-based access control means that you're going to get access to sensitive information based on the uh, requirements for your job function. Uh, and uh, there may be specific checks, additional checks that have to take place, uh, additional considerations for security. When somebody is getting access to sensitive information, secret information, top secret information, etc., which can include things like uh, extensive background checks, polygraphs, uh, uh, you know, history of uh, not only the individual but the individual's family members, propensity to commit crime, etc., uh, to be able to give them access to that sensitive information. Uh, so we want to perform checks and investigations, do reference checks, uh, make sure that the individual does actually have, uh, you know, significant past work history. They've demonstrated competencies in their uh, in their job functions. Uh, they have the technical skills, uh, uh, and we we do background or reference checks for that purpose. Um, uh, again, that, that show American Greed, I watched a, uh, an episode about a doctor uh, that was killing patients because he was just a really, really bad doctor. He didn't know how to perform procedures uh, and um, was a neurosurgeon. And, uh, and patients were dying because of his, his, uh, his poor medical practice uh, or medical skills. Uh, and um, it, apparently in the, in the medical industry or the healthcare industry, in the past, there was always kind of this assumption that uh, if you were a doctor at a previous hospital that you just did a good job there. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, there, in this particular case, the doctor's uh, background was not checked, but it turned out that he was put on leave of, uh, you know, medical leave or, or um, you know, temporary leave because of malpractice lawsuits and and uh, of issues with patients dying and whatnot at the previous hospital that he worked at. But the new hospital that hired him uh, needed that particular position filled because they could, they could charge for the procedures uh, and it became a financial decision and not really a decision on whether or not the doctor was, was medically sound. Um, and so the hospital opened themselves up to liability uh, by not doing adequate reference checks on the previous employment. Uh, same thing applied uh, to a pilot uh, that was, um, well, that crashed a plane. And that pilot had, uh, there was a very specific scenario where that pilot uh, just did not have the skills necessary to handle that emergency situation. Uh, and ha and uh, uh, the plane crashed be because of it. Um, and uh, uh, had the airline company done uh, uh, a, back, a reference check, they would have recognized that uh, in previous, uh, uh, um, with previous employment, he had similar issues. 
Background investigations, uh, resumes are often fabricated. They have uh, embellishments uh, of skill level, um, of accomplishments, of certification, of length of employment. Uh, so you need to make sure that you're doing adequate background investigations to ensure that what you're being sold is, is true. Uh, if there are gaps in, in, uh, in employment, uh, you know, salary uh, misrepresentations, certification misrepresentations, degrees, uh, uh, graduate and postgraduate degrees, credit history, driving records. These would all be things that we would check all, uh, on an individual. And we may not check them all. It depends on what the role of that individual is within the organization. Uh, for example, a driving record might not be necessary for a network engineer but it would be necessary for a school bus driver, right? We wanna make sure that we're not hiring a school bus driver that has, uh, uh, you know, an extensive, uh, you know, list of accidents or they've been involved in uh, multiple citations based on breaking uh, rules uh, uh, driving. All right. Uh, uh, benefits and timing of background checks uh, are, are done to include risk mitigation, qualifying the hires that we're bringing on board, uh, ultimately lowering hiring costs because if you end up hiring somebody that's not qualified, you're either going to have to train that individual to make them qualified or you're going to have to replace that individual, which means you're going to go through the same process again. Uh, reducing turnover, uh, asset protection, brand protection, etc. Uh, pretty obvious points, right? If you're hiring individuals, you want to make sure that those individuals are highly qualified. Uh, and, and they'll meet the, the needs of the organization. Uh, and, and quite frankly, even if, even if the embellishments are not related or, or the issues with the employee, potential employee are not related to their job function, you, you still can judge character and you can still judge an individual based on, uh, you know, how they represent themselves truthfully or non-truthfully uh, and, and whether or not you may want to hire that individual based on, on those uh, actions, right? Uh, types of background checks will depend on the, the position. Uh, if you're dealing directly with the public, um, you know, if you have access to confidential information, if you're in the healthcare industry, if you're a forklift operator, if you're driving a big rig, uh, if you're working with children, uh, obviously there are different types of checks that would apply to different individuals based on uh, their position within the company. Why might you want to check the credit of an individual? You know, it, it is... It's an interesting concept, right? Because you're hiring an individual to work, uh, whether they have a lot of credit card debt or you know whether they have uh, uh, a lot of loans and whatnot can be significant because particularly when it comes to an individual with clearance or access to really sensitive information. Uh, because if somebody has poor credit, they have a lot of credit card debt, uh, they have a lot of debt in general, uh, they can be coerced into doing things that maybe an, an individual that isn't in financial ruin might not be able to be, uh, you know, uh, not, might not be able to be influenced by. Uh, you know, so having a solid financial background, uh, good finances helps uh, with ensuring that the individual may, uh, you know, is not going to, you know, fall victim to, uh, some sort of financial bribe or something to that effect. Uh, also, you want to make sure that the Social Security number is valid for tax reporting purposes. Does the individual have any judgments or liens against them? Uh, what is their ability to handle debt in general? Um, now, if it's a janitor or uh, you know uh, a librarian or, or something like that where they don't really have access to personal information or access to private information, this may be a less of a concern. Uh, but certainly somebody with a clearance, with a top secret clearance, uh, or with access to really private information, this would be more of a concern. Obviously, criminal history is important. 
do you want to hire somebody uh, that has a uh, propensity to commit crime, right? And again, it would depend on the type of crime as well. Uh, theft, uh, whether it's petty theft or felonious uh, uh, theft, uh, would be something to consider, especially if you're dealing with finances or or physical product or something like that. Um, you know, physical abuse, uh, domestic abuse uh, speaks to character. Uh, you know, uh, just in general, lots of different types of crimes can can represent an individual if they have committed a lot of different crimes. Uh, criminal records and searches and background checks examine felonies only. And the FCRA limits criminal checks to seven years for employees earning $75,000 and under. There is no history time limit for anyone that earns more. I'm not sure that this has changed, uh, the FCRA limits, uh, at the time of publication, at the time that this book was created, those were the values. Uh, so that may have changed a little bit, uh, but it does at least give you an idea of, um, uh, you know, that there are some limitations to what you can actually, uh, you know, check on and gather and use as a decision process to hiring an individual. Uh, driving history could be important as well. Um, you know, does the individual have a driver's license? Uh, if it's certainly a position where they're having to drive a vehicle, that would be critical. Um, but maybe it's just a salesperson that has to travel around the country and has to rent a car uh, in order to perform their job function when they get to the location. If they don't have a valid driver's license or if their driver's license is suspended or whatnot, uh, they may not have the ability to rent a car, which would preclude them from doing their work and their business. Uh, certainly, if there are DUIs, uh, multiple DUIs could indicate other issues as well, uh, suspensions, cancellations, etc., uh, might be prudent or might be important to know. Okay, uh, certainly drug abuse, drug substance uh, testing, that's probably kind of self explanatory. Uh, prior employment. You know, this is probably one of the areas that gets embellished the most. Uh, what your job role is, what your job function is, what your position was with the company. Uh, I mean, if you think about it, uh, my the first company I worked for was a contractor for JPL, uh, for NASA. Uh, they're no longer in business. They were acquired by another company. So it'd be really difficult for somebody to verify whether or not I was actually the IT director at that company and what my job function was or what my responsibilities were. Uh, but a lot of people do tend to embellish and they'll embellish this area so that they can get the, the job or, or you know, they can you know, kind of elevate their experience or elevate their certifications knowing that they can maybe ask for more money, ask for more compensation for the, the, the position, et, et cetera. So uh, it's up to the employer, the prospective employer, to do their homework and make sure that the individual is representing themselves accurately. Uh, employment agreements uh, vary depending on the job role. Uh, they can be temporary assignments. They can be temporary projects. They can be full-time, part-time, etc. cetera. Uh, certainly non-disclosure agreements and clauses that protect the company Things like non-compete or non-disclosure agreements uh, are there to protect uh, intellectual property uh, and also customer relationships. Uh, certainly code of conduct. We talked about establishing a code of ethics for an organization. Uh, conflicts of interest and gift policies. Very, very important. Uh, we want to make sure that individuals aren't susceptible to bribery Uh quid pro quo type of scenarios. Uh, so a lot of organizations have very, very strict gifting policies. I remember when I was at NASA, uh, the we couldn't even accept a pen from a vendor, right? You know, some sort of marketing tool, they give you a pen or a pad of paper with their name on it. We couldn't even accept that as a, as a gift. 
uh, it was really, really strict um, because they wanted to ensure that we were not playing favorites to any particular vendor. All right. Uh, oftentimes, uh, employment will come with annual or quarterly performance or compliance reviews. Uh, uh, you know, you'll have a, a, a whole different set of policies or agreements or processors that are in place. We want to make sure that people are adhering to those uh, agreements and policies. Uh, and the goal is to allow employees to function, uh, you know, with certain guidelines and with certain guiding principles, but also allow us to minimize susceptibility uh, or the enticement to fraud, theft, abuse, uh, or waste. Okay. Job rotation uh, reduces the risk of collusion when working with sensitive information or systems and also provides backup coverage and succession planning. All right, job rotation means that uh, I do this job this month or this year or this quarter, I do a different job the next month. The idea being that not only am I being cross-trained across multiple roles and responsibilities, but I'm also able to independently identify anomalies in behavior, anomalies in processes and procedures uh, being enacted in the organization as I move from one job to the next. Separation of duties, split duties and roles to reduce errors or fraud. Uh, separation meaning uh, you're the voice network administrator, you're the server administrator or the email administrator Another person might be the uh, uh, you know infrastructure administrator, routers and switches, etc. Uh, the most common kind of separation of duty concept that most people understand is the two keys to launch a nuclear missile, right? Uh, you guys saw war games, the original war games, where uh, you know they they they're in the silo, they're in the missile silo, and and the the uh, enlisted officers or enlisted gentlemen are sitting there with the keys to launch the nuclear missiles. And uh, they get a, an order to launch and one guy turns the key, the other guy uh, doesn't turn the key so the missile doesn't launch. So, um, uh, and very dramatic scene, but it is an example of separation of duty um, and division of responsibility, right? Um, what we call dual control, actually, is the term that we use to describe that. Uh, now, turning of the two keys probably is more well-defined as dual control as opposed to separation of duties, uh, but it's kind of a similar concept, all right? Uh, oftentimes with smaller organizations, this is a little bit more difficult because you have individuals that that wear multiple hats just because the company just doesn't have the resources to hire separate individuals to perform these different functions. Um, the uh, uh, segregation of duties or the separation of duties uh, will, will depend on the organization's arc, you know, structure and so on. Least privilege, we talked about that before. Access to data only when it's needed to perform your job function. Uh, and access privileges are defined at different levels. Uh, you know, a, a good example of that would be, do you have read-only access? Do you have read-write access? Do you have execute access? Uh, do you have no access, right? Those are examples of different uh, levels of privileges that can be applied. Uh, mandatory vacations, we talked about that previously. Uh, work gets reassigned during the vacation so that any irregularities that might occur or might be uh, in, in place uh, could be identified. All right. It's also important that you control vendors, consultants, and contractors. Uh, now, you may apply similar standards to vendors, consultants, and contractors, but you're also going to have separate standards for them as well. Uh, you know, how do they access the resources within your enterprise? Do they need to be escorted? Are they going to be attached to the network using a, 
a, a guest VLAN or, or a contractor VLAN? Uh, they, do they have to sign non-disclosure agreements? Uh, do we have to do a background check on those individuals? Are they accessing classified information? Uh, more permanent visitors uh, tend to get kind of more permanent access. We have relationships with a lot of our clients where we can go in to the facility. We already have a badge um, because we go there every week. We already have a, a, a cubicle set up where we do our work. Uh, we already have an account in the Active Directory domain that we can authenticate to the network with and so on. But anyone with access to sensitive information has to be processed, has to be screened, uh, and contracts specifically with third parties have to be solid. Uh, they have to define the rules and the roles and the responsibilities of all parties involved in that relationship. Not only do the contractors, does the, does the customer need to be protected uh, from the contractors and consultants, but the consultants and contractors have to be protected as well. Uh, so as a consulting agency, Think Tank, uh, we have contracts that we put in place to protect us. Uh, you know, we're not going to be responsible for loss of information if, if we've deemed that that's a potential risk uh, in implementing a technology or whatever it might be. Okay, so it works both ways.